This is Musings of the Shy Podcast. I'm your host, Hiroja Shy. Hiroja Shy here with another episode in our Silk Road Marketplace series. And this episode is going to deal with Tor. Uh, it's episode 118. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Ready or not, here I come. And we're going to deal with the changes that have happened with Tor as a direct result of the collapse of Silk Road Marketplace. Now, um, a couple of these other uh, topics we talked about, the rise of them, have been kind of an indirect correlation between the collapse of the Silk Road Marketplace and their existence. You know, privacy, cash, uh, some of the exchanges that, that have um, become compliant, uh, the rise of decentralized market, um, decentralized exchanges, and the increase of OTCs and um, what else? Uh, the peer-to-peer market. Those things were kind of already somewhat occurring, except for the decentralized uh, exchange. That came directly as a result of the the collapse of both Mt. Gox and the Silk Road Marketplace. But some of those things um, would eventually would have happened in the cryptocurrency space. I don't think there would have been as much um, emphasis on them, on their creation, or if Bitcoin had adopted some of the privacy aspects or changes into its blockchain, many of these these uh, coins may not have come to existence. Um, but those are what ifs, and that's not what we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, what I can tell you is that Tor has dramatically changed because of the Silk Road Marketplace. The government made such a crackdown and has done uh, shut down a lot of dark market. Uh, Darknet marketplaces be, because of the Silk Road, because of its influence within the Tor network um, and the de anonymization of Tor, that there's been significant up down changes to Tor. But also because of the way Tor was attacked, there has uh, been a renewed interest in another of creating uh, other, other internets, if you will. And we'll talk about those as we go along. But before we get into all of that, the news. So this comes from Reza Technica. Uh, it's written by John Brod- uh, Brodakin. FCC chair wants to replace net neutrality with voluntary comments, uh, voluntary commitments. Voluntary net neutrality commitments may not be so easy to enforce. The Federal Communication Commission chairman, uh, Ajit Pai, reportedly met with broadband industry lobby groups this week to discuss his plans for eliminating net neutrality rules. Instead of the FCC continuing to enforce net neutrality rules, Pai wants internet service providers to voluntarily agree to maintain an open internet, uh, writers reported yesterday, citing three sources briefing, uh, briefing on the meeting. Uh, Pai wants to shift enforcement of net neutrality from FCC to Federal Trade Commission, according to the Wall Street Journal, which also talked to people familiar with the meeting. To per- preserve the, base, the basic tenets of net neutrality, the plans will require broadband providers to pledge to abide by net neutrality principles such as no blocking or paid prioritization of internet traffic, the Journey ro- Journal report. That will allow the FTC to go after violators for deceptive or unfair fair trade practices. Reuters says that Pi discussed his preliminary plan with major telecommunication trade groups, but did not identify which ones. The officially, official's brief on the meeting said that Pi suggested companies com, uh, commit in writing to open internet principles and include them in their terms of services, which would make them binding. Even if these uh, commitments are legally binding, enforcing net neutrality guidelines would become more complicated under the FTC. With current rules, customers or companies can file a complaint with the FCC or get a decision from the government expert agency on communication networks, potentially putting a stop to abusive behavior. The FTC uses a different process for enforcing rules, including the writing extensive rules and deciding whether an ISP has violated them. The FCC files lawsuits against companies over unfair or deceptive acts or practices, letting a court make the decision. Replacing clear rules of the road with voluntary systems where broadband providers decide ahead of time what rules they would like to follow and when they can change those rules would unilaterally open the door to massive market abuse, including unreasonable low data caps, inflated prices for some content, and preferring cable broadband content over smaller independent competitors, consumer advocacy public knowledge said today. 
Former FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler recently warned the FCC oversight wouldn't be enough to police ISPs. The FCC is an enforcement authority, not a rulemaking authority, Wheeler told Aris in January. They can say, we think this is unfair and deceptive act of practice, but they can't say, here's how networks have to operate so, that, so they're fast, fair, and open. We asked the FCC for further information on plans and we'll provide an update if we get one. The meeting with trade groups suggests that Pi is inching closer to making his plans public, possibly as soon as this month, and that the FCC vote could occur in May or June. So, whew. man, are they accelerating some of these changes within the uh, new administration. Uh, the rest of this article talks about uh, Title II, which deals with the erosion of net brutality, but we'll save that for a, a different type of a discussion. Uh, Ted Crunch, the company behind Adblock Plus is acquiring micropayment service uh, Flatair. This is from by Anthony Hoff. EO, the parent company behind Adblock Plus, announced this morning that it has acquired Flatair. The two companies were already working together on a project initially called Flatter Plus, where users can allocate a monthly payment to online publishers. The money is then distributed based on users' engagement with the different sites and articles. Kind of sounds like what Brave is doing with uh, their token platform and Bitcoin. This sounds pretty similar, similar, similar to what Flatter was already doing, except the users didn't have to hit a button to Flatter a website. In fact, this is now being pitch as an overhaul zero click version of the main flatter product and give up and can sign up for early access you can sign up for early access here over the past several months it's been very clear that that we need to go beyond a partnership and truly bring a uh, flatter into the EO uh, family says EO founder till uh, Feta in the acquisition release this allows us to go the extra mile and finalize our version of enabling hundreds of millions of users to choose how they want to pay for the content they consume. This is a game changer. So, uh, you know, the the usage of as online has been broken for years. It just really has. And there's just this big mad scrambles. We're trying to find a way to monetize basically consumers online and um, you know YouTube is going through a big or I should say Google is going through a big um, overhaul if you will with so many people pulling ads or so many companies pulling ads from YouTube for, for the simple fact that they don't want their ads to be associated with uh, hateful content or uh, not the best uh, product to be associated with their brand if you will uh, Google has made a terms of service change with their uh, YouTube accounts to where if you don't have um, 10,000 views or more, your video doesn't get monetized. So that can change a lot for a lot of people. Um, most most users on YouTube don't even get that high, but even if you had a steady like 1,000 or 2,000 views, if your type of um, user base were of was of high-end clientele, like people with um, incomes 55 plus. So the ads in front of it might have been high-end retail luxury gifts. You might have gotten a little bit more in the uh, cookie jar than, say, other content providers simply because your targeted audience was more desired. So I guess we'll see what the, the changes will bring about, but I don't know. Ads are annoying, and that's why I block them, so... I honestly don't know how places are going to monetize if they don't run ads other than doing a subscription service, a donation service, or doing what yours is doing where you might um, have a half of an article or three-fourths of an article available and you have to um, you have to pay to see the rest of it, if you will. So I have a link in the show notes. Uh, it's from a Facebook post and video. Um, it's called. It's by Bitcoin. Is a girl Tokyo 72 hours of Bitcoin survival challenge. Uh, the Japanese government accepted Bitcoin as legal payment. Uh, Ruby will guide you to live in on Bitcoin in Tokyo. Want some insights and click and guide into how Bitcoin works as a currency in Tokyo? What kind of products and services you can buy using Bitcoin? Uh, therefore, we invited Ruby as our Tokyo Bitcoin guide to help you discover more about Bitcoin in the city. 
Um, how many dollars should you be paying the Bitcoin to rent the Kimon? Repost and leave your answers. So, <clears throat> on the posts, uh, you can leave your Bitcoin ID. Uh, the first 100 answers will win participant prize. Bitcoin's worth one USD. So, Bitcoin is a website. Um, it's a very interesting video. Um, there are more places to shop um, in Japan with Bitcoin prior to the acceptance of it being an um, accepted legal tender and more and more places uh, opening up. It would be interesting to see by the end of the year who does better, Russia or Japan. That is, if Russia does accept uh, Bitcoin as a legacy payment. And if we have more of these places that are accepting uh, Bitcoin on, on the merchant base level, when is the transition going to be to more and more and more people are going to be paid in Bitcoin? I mean, it's already happened with freelancers and computers, but I'm just talking about regular eight, everyday people, you know, the cashier, the vendor, uh, the person, you know, who supplies like the candies or the sodas, uh, those type of deals, if you will, those type of people in the ecosystem. This is from Bits Online. Article by uh, Evan uh, Vagaret. Bitcoiner beware of Bitcoin scams on the rise in early 2017, according to a new report. As of March, as of March, you were more likely than ever to fall vic victim to a Bitcoin scam, according to the report from the digital security firm Zero Fox Research. Zero Fox attributes this increase in scams to the monumental rise in the Bitcoin price that has taken place in the first few months of 2017. In early March, Bitcoin's value surpassed the price of an ounce of gold for the first time in its history. Initial 2017 marks the first time that Bitcoin has hit $1,000 since before the Mt. Gox hack of late 2013. In his report, the researchers firm attribute Bitcoin's hard-coded features to the draw of online scammers. The digital currencies, decentralized anonymity, and reversible transactions all make it easier for scammers to steal from people the traditional online payment methods. So these are the type of scams, just to kind of uh, give you an idea. Fake Bitcoin, Bitcoin wallets containing malware. This happens on Android all the time, but um, Apple started getting hit quite a bit um, on the, on the run-up to the uh, price increase. Phishing, Bitcoin flipping, doubling or tripling your investment overnight. That is a consistent scam with the cryptocurrency space in general. And pyramid schemes. Uh, one coin is one of those pyramid schemes. Typically um, mining pools, um, cloud service mining pools are typically the, that type of pyramid scheme if you will. Uh, Australian law to end double taxation of Bitcoin uh, stalled by Kevin Helms. This is from Bitcoin.com. Last year, Australian Treasurer Scott Morrison promised to swiftly act on changing the goods and service tax, or GST law, in order to end the double taxation of Bitcoin and other digital currencies. However, over 14 months have passed without any legislative process. Now the issue is no longer a priority, and Bitcoin continues to bear a GS GST twice in Australia. A double GST treatment of Bitcoin. The Australian tax office currently does not consider Bitcoin and other digital currencies money for GST purposes. Instead, it's considered a form of inten intangible property under the GST Act and regulations. Consumers using Bitcoin to pay for goods and services are effectively bearing a GST twice, the government describes. Bitcoin users are taxed when acquiring the digital currency and again when, it, when using it to purchase goods and services. Uh, last year was a priority. The government started working with fintech industry in March 2016 to reform the GST law, which, gained, which aimed to end the double GST treatment of Bitcoin. One solution discussed was to defy the Australia, define the digital currency as money under the GST Act with the government to agree. Uh, Australia's National Fintech Industry Association, Fintech Australia, provides input into the, into the development of government innovation agenda. The association, the fintech community, collaborated and drafted a document of recommendation reforms. Early last year, the government identified the GST, the GST taxation change as a core reform priority. Treasurer Morrison said he would act on it quickly and promise to draft legislation. This year is not a priority. Over 14 months have gone by with no legislative practice, and fintech 
Australia CEO Danielle Zito told Inviticus.com publication this week that fintech community is so eagerly waiting the, da- the, the, the draft legislation which Morris promised. However, so far there has been no further movement made. By all accounts, the government is still committed to act on the issue, but it's far from my priority. And it's kind of skipping around. Uh, the longer the government takes to amend the GST law, the, the further Australia fi- falls behind the other countries. The European Union and, uh, had decided back in October 2015 that the digital currencies are not to be double taxed. The UK also had a similar policy in place since March of 2014, and Japan had recently started to consider Bitcoin a method of payment as well as abolishing consumption tax on acquiring Bitcoin. Australians are early adopters, but the uptake has been limited because no one is certain how they might be taxed. It, it has slowed the adoption of these new currencies in Australia. So with Japan adopting um, uh, bit, Bitcoin as a, a legal payment method, that I think this would put pressure on Australia, especially if within, let's say, the first or second quarter, there is a significant economic increase in Japan by the usage of these type of cryptocurrencies. Um, Japan... Say Japan, South Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, like the whole South. Australia is part of the whole Southeast Eastern Asian Economic Development Area. Uh, it's kind of sort of like the big Kahuna in the area, as as far as the fact that it's strongly associated with Western powers. But it does trade and do a significant lot of business with Japan. Um, it would be interesting to see if there is any kind of economic pressures that developed. I would imagine it would take a bit more of a domino effect if maybe Indonesia or Malaysia were to follow suit with Japan. Even if India were, or if India were to be a signal, there's, you know, India and Australia, they compete quite uh, extensively and closely for dominance in the South, Southeast Asia. Um, Australia actually economically has been losing ground to both India, Malaysia, and Indonesia over the, the last few years, um, with South Korea kind of be in the mix there, as well as um, a dark horse of um, Vietnam is when it comes to economic develop development in that region. But I would imagine maybe like one of the either India, Malaysia, or Indonesia, one of those three were also to follow suit with Japan. I would imagine Australia would dust itself off and get rid of that taxation and maybe even go as far as to consider it legal tender, or at least a legal payment format. But other than that, it's just slow walking it, if you will. So uh, this comes from the the Hindu Times, and I just found it very fascinating. Uh, show that EVMs can be hacked, the EC, the EC EC throws open challenge. Um, doesn't state who the special correspondent is. So what are we talking about here? Expert politicians invited to demonstrate in May that the, all those alleging that EVMs, which are electronic voting machines used by the election, election commission, were tampered with in the recent assembly election, or that they could be hacked, the electoral body has thrown an open challenge asking them to prove the allegation. The exercise may be carried out in the first week of May. Computer experts and political leaders will be invited to demonstrate site to show that the voting machines are not secure. This move comes days after the opposition party met the Le- election commission and requested to replace EVMs with paper ballots as people had lost trust in the efficiency of machines. Following similar allegations, the EC has given an open invitation to experts to demonstrate that EVMs can be tampered with. However, the commission said no one could prove that it could be hacked. After the Utah, Pradesh, and Punjab assembly election, the opposition parties have on several occasions alleged that the EVMs were tampered with, and each time the EC has maintained that the machines were secure, given the technology used and the administrative process adopted to ensure the safety. The commission has turned, has turned such charges incorrect and baseless, stating that none of the complaints have come up with any proof to support their allegations. Um, to any hacker out there, that would be a signal for challenge accepted, if you will. Oh, and just for a little side note, uh, Bitcan is a exchange and wallet in uh, Japan. And that is it for the news. On to our story about Tor.
So what is TOR? Uh, here's an overview. Uh, the TOR network is a group of volunteer-operated service that allows people to improve their privacy and security on the internet. TOR users employ this network by connecting through a series of virtual tunnels rather than making a direct connection, thus allowing both organizations and individuals to share information over a public network without compromising their privacy. Along the same line, TOR is an effective censorship circumvention circumvention tool allowing its users to reach otherwise blocked destinations or content. Tor can also be used as building a building block for software developers to create new communication tools with built-in privacy features. Individuals use Tor to keep websites from tracking them and their family members or to connect to new sites, instant messaging services, or the like when they are blocked by local network providers. Tor's hidden service lets users publish websites and other services without needing to reveal the location of their site. Individuals also use Tor for socially sensitive communication, chat rooms and web forums, for rape and abuse survivors or people with illnesses. Journalists use Tor to, Tor to communicate more safely with whistleblowers and descendants. Non-government organizations, NGOs, use Tor to allow their workers to connect to their home website while they're in a foreign country without notifying everybody nearby that they're working with that organization. Groups such as uh, Indie Media recommend Tor is for, safeguard for safeguarding their members' online privacy and security. Activist groups like the Electronic Frontier Foundation recommend Tor as a me mechanism for maintaining civil liberties online. Corporations use Tor as a safety way to conduct competitive analysis and to protect sensitive procurement patterns from eavesdropping. They also use it to replace traditional VPNs, which reveal the exact amount of timing of communication, which locations have uh, employees working late, which locations have employees consulting job hunting websites, and which research divisions are communicating with companies' patent lawyers. A branch of the U.S. Navy uses TOR for open source intelligence gathering, and one of his teams uses TOR while deployed in the Middle East recently. Law enforcement uses TOR for visiting or surveilling websites without leaving government IP addresses in their web logs and for security during sting operations. The variety of people who use TOR is actually part of what makes it so secure. TOR hides you among the other users on the network, so, more, so the more populous and diverse the user base for TOR is, the more your anonymity will be protected. Why we need TOR. Using TOR protects you against a common form of internet surveillance known as traffic analysis. Traffic analysis can be used to infer who is taking, who's talking to whom over a public network. Knowing the source and destination of your internet traffic allows others to track your behavior and interests. This can impact your checkbook if, if for example, an e-commerce site uses price dis discrimination based on your country or institution of origin or if you, have, if you can even threaten your job and your physical safety by revealing who and where you are. For example, if you're traveling abroad and you connect to your employer's computers to check or send email, you inadvertently reveal your national origin and professional affiliation to anyone observing the network, even if the connection is encrypted. Okay, and then it explains how traffic analysis works. A basic problem for the privacy minded is the recipient of your communication can see what you sent by looking at headers. Um, Explain it some more. Okay, staying anonymous. Uh, I'm trying to skip it around here. Tor can't solve all anonymity problems. It focuses only protecting the transport of data. You need to use protocol-specific soft support software if you don't want the sites you visit to see your identifying information. For example, you can use your Tor browser while browsing the web to withhold some information about your computer configuration. Also, to protect your anonymity by smart. To be smart. Okay, the future of Tor. Providing a usable, anonymous network on the internet today is an ongoing challenge. We want software that meets user needs. We also want to keep the network up and running in a way that handles as many users as possible. Security and usability don't have to be at odds. As Tor usability increases, it will attract more users, which will increase the possibility, source, and, de and destination of each communication, thus increasing the security of everyone. We're making progress, but we need your help. Please consider running a relay or volunteering as a developer. Ongoing trends in law, policy, and technology threaten anonymity as never before, undermining our ability to speak and read freely online. These trends also undermine national security and critical infrastructure by making communications among individual organizations, corporations, and governments more vulnerable to analysis. Okay, so that is what Tor is, and that was the method upon which uh, Ross Ulbricht 
utilize to set up this Silk Road Marketplace. So after its collapse, after the Silk Road Marketplace was collapsed, and again, we discussed it in the Silk Road update and a little bit about Agents of Silk Road, in which we talked about is not really certain how uh, Ross Ulbricht's server was, um, the information for it was obtained. It's very highly uh, susceptible. You know, no one believes the government. And given the recent uh, court cases, partic particularly when it comes to CP, that's been found through, uh, tore through a uh, case called Child Pin, in which um, the FBI pretended to run a child pin site in order to um, nab uh, child pornographers, the purveyor and the uh, users, if you will. Um, a lot of cases have been dismissed because the FBI will not um, disclose how they were able to do what they did and track people down. So a lot of very, very bad people are, are walking the streets because the FBI is not willing to disclose their technique in open court. And even though Ross Albrecht has been convicted and he's serving a life sentence and everything's in appeal, there's been, going over the court case and just in general, how the initial server that allowed them to track down and find Ross Albrecht and find out the contents of the Silk Road Marketplace and monitor it and track people down, how they're able to obtain that is um, very highly susceptible. But one of the biggest things that happened afterwards was that a series of dark net marketplaces were all shut down. And it was a result of a joint operation between Europe, the United States, Interpol, and a few others to shut down these drug marketplaces and other types of dark net places. And it was called Operation... Uh, Onymous, O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, and they specifically sought and hacked uh, hidden services on the Torn network. Uh, this is from the Wicca site, and I will also uh, your just the European Judicial Cooperative Corporation Union. I will uh, re really uh, read their publicity statement, but. On August 5th and 6th of November 2014, a number of websites initially claimed to be over 400 were shut down during the, uh, including drug markets such as Silk Road 2.0, Cloud9, and Hydra. Other sites targeted include money laundering sites and counterband, counterband sites. Uh, typically, those sites are uh, selling cigarettes. The operation involved the police forces of 17 countries. In, in total, there were 17 arrests. A 26-year-old software developer was arrested in San Francisco and accused of running uh, Silk Road 2.0 on the pseudonym of Def Con. Um, he has since been um, sentenced and everything. Def Con was one of the primary tar targets. Within hours of seizure, a third incarnation uh, of the site, Silk Road 3.0. Silk Road has previously been seized in October of 2013 and resurrected a week later in Silk Road 2.0. One million in Bitcoin was seized, along with $180,000 in cash, gold, silver, and drugs. Of the 414 illicit services that were initially claimed to have been shut down, few were online marketplaces like Silk Road. A complaint file, filed on November 7, 2014 in the United States District Court of Southern District of New York, seeking the forture of any and all assets of the following dark mark, dark market websites operating on the Tor network referred to just 27 sites, 14 of which were claimed to be drug markets. The others allegedly sold counterfeit currency, forged identity documents, or stolen credit cards. The U.S. and European agencies sought to publicize the claimed success of their six-month-long operation, which went flawlessly. The U.K. National Crime Agency sent out a tweet mocking Tor users. The official Europol press released, quote, Quoted a U.S. Homeland Security investigation official who stated, Our efforts have disrupted a website that allows illicit black market activities to evolve and expand and provide a safe haven for illegal vices such as weapon distribution, drug trafficking, and murder for hire. Other leading drug markets in the deep web were unaffected, such as Argo, and this is obviously an old Wicca date, but Evolution, which would, would then later on after this um, crackdown by the government would perform an exit scan 
um, and Andromeda, which also perform an X exam. Whereas Silk Road did not, in fact, disrupt distributed weapons or other contract killings, evolution did allow trade of weapons as well as drugs. Prior to the closure of Silk Road 2.0, Argo already carried more listings in Silk Road, and Evolution was also expected to overtake it. Argo and Evolution are more professional professional operations than Silk Road, with more advanced security. The rest of the alleged Silk Road manager is thought to have largely due to the series of careless mistakes. The figure of 414 Darknet sites, which was widely reported internationally and appeared in many newsletter headlines, was later adjusted without explanation to upwards of 50 sites. The true figure is thought to be near 27 sites, to which all 414 onion addresses direct. Australian journalist Nick uh, Sova claimed that they have discovered 276 C sites based on a crawl of all onion sites, of which 153 were scam, clone, or phishing sites. So the Tor exploit. The number of sites the police initially claimed to have infiltrated led to speculation that the weakness in the Tor network had been exploited. This possibility was downplayed by Andrew uh, Lehman, a representative of the nonprofit, uh, not-for-profit TOR uh, project, suggesting that the execution of traditional police work such as the following big coins was most likely. Lehman suggested that such claims were overblown and that the authorities wanted to simply give the impression that they had cracked TOR to deter, uh, deter others from using it for criminal purposes. A representative of the Europol was secreted about the method used, saying this is something we we want to keep for ourselves. That way, the way we do this, we can't share with the whole world because we want to do it again and again and again. Well, that didn't end up happening. And it was because they, in essence, found an exploit of the toy net, the Tor network. Uh, it has been speculated that hidden services could have been de-anonymized if law enforcement replicated the research by CERT at uh, Carnegie Mellon University up until July 30th patch to migrate the issue. So this patch was um, fixed, but that's not the end of the overall issues with Tor. If sufficient relay nodes were uh, DOS, an attacker could perform traffic confirmation attacks in connection with a syllable attack by forcing traffic to route over law enforcement control nodes. A theory practically supported by logs released by the administrator of DOCSPIN. Court documents released on November 15 generated serious research ethic concerns in, in the TOR and security research communities about warrantless exploits, which presumably had been active from February 2014 to July 4, 2015. The TOR project patched the vulnerability and the FBI denied having paid Carnegie Mellon $1 million to exploit it. So basically, so uh, the first Silk Road went down in October. October? November, December, January. So within four months, they've had this attack plan initiated and put out right after the collapse of the, the marketplace, Silk Road Marketplace, the first one anyways. So global action against dark net markets on Tor Network. This is being released from the Eurojust as their press release. It was released on November 7th, uh, 2014. On November 6, judicial authorities and law enforcement agencies from the U.S. and more than a dozen European countries undertook a joint action against Dartnet marketplaces. On these marketplaces, which run as hidden services access to the Tor network, illegal items including weapons and drugs, and even contract killers as advertised. Users and vendors and those hosting these hidden service services were, until now, believed to be relatively safe from prosecution. This action will shake that belief. The dark net market such as Silk Road 2.0 launched just one month after the original Silk Road was shut down by U.S. authorities. Hydra and Cannabis Road have been taken down and servers hosting the illegal marketplace seized. Several vendors and administrators have been arrested. Key figures at glance. 17 arrests, 13 search warrants issued, 414 hidden services seized, splash page posted, um, Hardware and digital media, media sees. Bitcoins were worth approximately 1 million USD and 180 in euro in cash, drugs, gold, and silver seized. Countries involved in the operation codenamed uh, Anamas included Belgrade, the Czech Republic, Finland, France, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, Latvia, Lithuania, Lithuania Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Romania, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. The judicial part of the investigation in Europe was coordinated throughout the action day 
by Eurojust. Europol supported law enforcement authorities through their cyber unit EC3. The action day took place in close cooperation with the U.S. Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Department of Homeland Security. The operation fits the objectives of Project uh, ITLM, illegal trade in online marketplaces, an official Dutch initiative supported by the European Union to enhance cooperation between law enforcement and the judicial authorities in effort to hinder the development of online marketplaces. The case of Landmark uh, is a landmark in a continuing battle against cybercrime. It marks the beginning, not the end, of the pursuit of those who abuse the internet for illegal profits, states Conan Hernes, assistant to the national member of the Netherlands at Eurojust and leader of the Coordination Center. Mr. Hermans said that the case was important to show that criminals can no longer hide from authorities. They, they will be tracked down and prosecuted to the full extent of law. Uh, the number of known online hosts um, appeared to be like around 1,700 and it dropped all the way down to 700. TOR, an, 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 an acronym for the Onion Router, is a, is a free network designed to anonymize your real IP address by routing your traffic through many servers of the TOR network. TOR is used by a variety of people for both illicit and illicit purposes. In fact, it had always been acknowledged in the original Silk Road case. The person who put the press brief together was Eula Bergenstorm. So, this came around November of 14. This article was from Giz Gizmodo uh, by Kate uh, Nibs, and it's the full list of dark net markets shut down by Operation Anonymous. So last week, a coalition of international law enforcement agencies, including the FBI and Europol, carried out the widespread digital sting arresting alleged operators. So what is the list? So here we go. Here's the fully confirmed list of sites sh uh, sh shuttered. Let me know if you've seen any of them. Alpaca, Black Market, Blue Sky, uh, Bungie 54, Cannabis UK, Cloud9, Deepu, Fake Real Plastic, Fake ID, Farmer One, Fast Cash, Flux Vamp, Golden Nug Nugget, Hydra, <laughs> Pablo Escobar Drugstore, Pandora, PayPal Center, Real Cards, Silk Road 2.0, Smokables, Soul Unified USD Counterfeits, Super Note Counter, Tor Bazaar, Topix, The Green Machine, The Hidden Market, and Zero Squad. And she obtained her information through Forbes. Now, another operation went down. Uh, this was launched in 2016. Operation CatchNet launched to track CP on the darknet. Operate on December 9th, the federal police, a police of federal, executed eight search warrants through Sao, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Mango das Cruz, and Oscos regions. The search warrants were a part of an ongoing investigation into pedophiles in the country. Uh, this comes from the Dark Net Markets, written by C. Uh, Allens. Specifically, those who use the Dark Net for spread. Uh, such material. The police just announced that one raid resulted in the capture of a suspected offender. Brazilian federal police on the day officers executed the attack sent to launch Operation CatchNet. Like many police forces worldwide, the Brazilian federal police rapidly learned that the dark net was not only an online drugstore, it also functioned as an outlet for firearm trade and child abuse media. Operation CatchNet, like the FBI's controversial Operation Pacifier and the Norwegian's widely successful Operation Darkroom aims to put to stop the dark net CP. The task force developed the initiative is essentially groundwork following Norway's investigation. Norwegian authorities expressed it in an interview with NK uh, the I with uh, NRK that the Operation Darkroom ran its course. Authorities arrested dozens of sus suspects received additional funding for fighting dark net and identified five thousand another five thousand and other suspects worldwide. Uh, we've covered the police concerns when one of the most disturbing view viewers of the CP seemingly vanished to Sweden. Those those were unsure whether this tale was true, and if they were, they had no idea where to find the person who operated the account. Darknet pedophiles concern law enforcement officials across the globe. Darknet marketplace buyers quickly learned not to purchase firearms from Germany or on the Darknet at all. For that matter, Germany cracked down on Darknet weapon trade and counterfeit euros, seemingly leaving CP behind. 
Brazil joins the ranks of the countries with official task force today dedicated to hunting the internet for these type of people. Australia's task force Argos deserves a noble mission for the takedown of Britain's worst pedophile ever. Moreover, a similar team recently took down a CC ring in China that consisted of 100 or more members. Uh, the federal police seized computers, hard drives, cell phones, and general storage devices during the raids. Forensic analysis, according to the press release, received the electronic and started decrypting the media in need of the decryption. Officers shortly after the raid discovered that not every electronic device required decryption. While executing a search warrant in the municipality of Oskoskos, officer, officers arrested the 50-year-old suspect. Police stopped him and located two HDs and two USB, USB drives in his car. The cell phone the officers discovered was one of the devices that did not require decryption. The now prisoner used a social media application to receive illicit material for the children in the cell. The phone contains CP as well. The investigators knew that the suspect used the dark net to store and share the media amongst other like-minded individuals. Moreover, the investigators also knew the social media applications, notably WhatsApp and Kiki, were used to obtain these Im images and videos. Uh, the federal police charged the man with ART 241B of child and an adolescent statute, a charge that carries a mandatory one to four year prison sentence. That seems rather small for child uh, pornography. Maybe there'll be multiple charges, but that's what's happening in Brazil. So let's talk about these other two operations and then we'll kind of talk about what Tor's response to essentially um, the government going after uh, Tor in such a manner to, you know, catch the bad guys. And don't get me wrong, some of these are very bad, bad people. But overall, it's just the mechanism and the manner upon which they're going after places um, and people and breaking, in essence, breaking the trust of Tor is very deeply concerning to me, particularly when they are not willing to um, disclose their techniques in open court. So Operation Pacifier was a large-scale hacking campaign by the FBI launched in 2015 to investigate criminal activity on the dark web. It was the largest such operation since Operation Torpedo, a malware known to law enforcement as a network investigating technique which were used to discover the real IP addresses of Tor users from the seized child porn sites. The international nature of the operation raised a number of legal questions about the FBI's international jurisdiction and the subject of ongoing legal and journalistic investigation. So I thought Pacifier had the malware, but it looks like Operation Torpedo did. So Operation Torpedo was a 2011, a very early uh, attempt at Tor to compromise three different hidden service hosting child pornography, which was then targeting anyone who happened to access using a network investigated technique to it, used a flash application that would ping a user's real IP address back to the FBI control server, rather than routing their traffic through the Tor network and protecting their identity. So it's this malware technique that um, the FBI has been using to go after a child. And because of that, um, they had this thing called the child. So Operation Dark Room, a Dutch National Prosecution Service and police launch a hidden service in the global dark net enforcement operation. This is by uh, Deep Dot Web, and that's the name of the author as well. So the new scare tactic reposted from the Dutch prosecution site, the Dutch National Pro uh, Prosecution Service and police launched a so-called hidden service on the dark net today. The setup took place within the framework of Operation Hyperion, the first global dark net marketplace enforcement operation ever, was conducted 22nd, October 22nd and 28th. Via the hidden service, an English dark net website, the National Prosecution Service and Police, show that the dark net community that they acted actively in the dark net in the first place. Secondly, the team communicates about the detection and prosecution and many large vendors on the underground marketplace. Thirdly, the hidden service points out that buyers of illegal goods, goods aren't anonymous in the dark net as they might think. The dark net website can be visited via the regular internet via this link. 
It is important to notice that there are some sus suspected suspects using nicknames on the darknet corresponding to the names of large industries. Those companies have nothing to do with suspicion. The criminal justice actions. Apart from the launch of the hidden service, some criminal justice actions take place in the Netherlands last week. Um, October 10th, a man was arrested in Zupin in a criminal investigation in the Dutch National P Public Prosecution Office. Tuesday, October 25th, the pretrial chamber decided to extend his detention within 90 days. The man is accused of vending by using an online underground marketplace on the dark net. Another Dutch result of note during the action week was that the prosecution office in Rotterdam announced the prosecution of two 20 and 26 year old brothers in the region. They were accused of using of joining adjoining money laundering by the use of bitcoins and large amounts of money in relation to the underground dealing of forbidden goods on diversive dark nets. Operation Hyperion is the first operation ever coordinated on a global scale. The operation aims to take action of the buyers and sellers of illicit drugs, weapons, fake, and stolen identities and other legal activities using the dark net global marketplace. Amongst other activities such as computer hacking, murder for hire, and money laundering, law enforcement agencies participating in the operation included the Dutch National Police, Prosecution Office in the Netherlands, and Europol. And then Operation Dark Room. In 2015, the Norwegian police were tipped off by the FBI after they uncovered what they believe is a pedophile ring operating across the country. Launching Operation Dark Room, to investigate these claims, police infiltrated the secret underbelly of the internet known as the Deep Web. It would take another year before enough evidence to bring these suspects to justice. Finally, at the end of November 2016, police announced that they had placed 51 men under arrest, making it the largest pedophile bust in Norwegian history. According to reports of the 51 people arrested in the sting operation, at least two have been LF officials. One had been a teacher and many others were described as highly educated people such as IT professionals, doctors, and lawyers. We have to clear perception that like-minded individuals meet with each other in so-called dark net, where they can talk with one another and cultivate their interests in, in children at peace, said the head of the Operation Dark Room, Hilda uh, Reskress. In total, there was 150 terabyte of material collected as a result of the investigation. Contained with those 150 terabytes, or live stream videos displaying the sexual abuse of infants and children of all ages, chat logs, photos, and movies. During a press conference, uh, Rekas told reporters the material shown, among other things, the penetration of toddlers, child, children being tied up, children having sex with animals, and children having sex with other children. Police also stated that it's not only one network of pedophiles, but several that were uncovered during the investigation. The report also states that some of the men have been sexually abusing their own children. Another man arrested in the operation had pregnant girlfriend at the time and had conversations with other members of the network promised to sexually abuse the baby once he or she was born. All these men have been from various regions with Norway, with the exception of one individual who had been living abroad. In the wake of the hashtag PC, Pizzagate hysteria, some individuals have become concerned with the identity of the suspected living abroad and they were curious why the story has not received more media coverage. Uh, the New York Times ran a story on the investigation on November 20th, 2016, but it was quickly pulled from their website. And according to a piece written by Reno Berkeley from the Inquisitor, the Times wasn't the only news outlet to pull the plug on the breaking news. ABC News and the Washington Post also claimed that they had pulled the story from the AP. The only U.S. news outlet to keep the story was Fox News. According to Berkeley, wrote a scant four-paragraph article on the pedophile bus. The dismissal of the shocking New Origin scandal by several major news outlets has since thrown some, so, thrown more gasoline on the fire of a sect of people who are already suspicious of mainstream media reporting. According to the rebuttal to the various theories that have emerged since Operation Dark Room, the AK, AP claims that some stories only have a shelf life of 24 hours before they disappear from their website, and that it is not a planned media blackout, as some have speculated. Okay, and there was Operation pacifier in which uh, the FBI had utilized um, a website to hack and track um, child pedophiles. Um, this article comes from the Star Trubin. Um, it was published October 9th, 2016. Uh, Minnesotans caught in the FBI child port porn sting raising constitutional concerns. At least three Minnesota men have been charged with the participation in a vast 
the secretive child pornography internet forum after being swept up in a far-reaching FBI sting considered the, the biggest hacking investigation to federal law enforcement history. Just Department officials say that the FBI's Operation Pacifier has helped build cases against roughly 200 people while identifying dozens of abused children and those who exploited them. But Operation Pacifier has also triggered a series of legal challenges that are stirring constitutional debates over how law enforcement tries to smoke out criminals in the darkest corner of the web. Federal judges in some cases have thrown out evidence on the ground that the FBI shouldn't have been allowed to hack private computers all across the country without, with a warrant from just one jurisdiction. Other remains concerns that the FBI actually committed a far worse crime, disseminating child porn while investigating the case. So all these cases were happening. Um, the taking down of the dark websites, the fact that um, child pornography investigations were happening um, with um, the FBI and various other judicial uh, agencies um, attacking the Tor network, uh, setting up hidden servers, uh, malware, uh, using a technique that has been pretty much suspected and almost near proven that uh, cert the method by Carnegie Melanie that Tor has been de anonymized and we'll get into that method in a moment but Tor is at a loss and again just like exchanges uh, the privacy concerns that we talk about in privacy cash the decentralized marketplace is like the kind of more of a positive response to where we no longer have centralized servers um, these um, exploits that have been associated with Tor in general that have been attacked have been something that have been kind of discussed about, but because of the spotlight, the extra scrutiny, because of the activities of a few, it has caused pre a significant amount of pressure on Tor in and of itself to where it has to um, not only rebrand itself, but also it has to literally rebuild itself up to the ground, up from the ground, from the ground up, if you will. To, to be that privacy protection that people desperately need in the world. So let's talk about um, the method that was used to de-anonymize uh, Tor and then a malware problem. And then just other problems in general with, um, with Tor and then what the Tor project is doing to basically um, build itself up. Did, this comes from the, the Tor project blog itself, did the FBI pay a university attack Tor users? This, came, this is a statement that came out November 11th, 2015 by Alon N. The Tor project has learned more about last year's attack by Carnegie Melton Research on the hidden service subsystem. Apparently these researchers were paid by the FBI to attack hidden services service users in a broad sweep and then shift their data to find people whom they can accuse of crimes. We publicized the attack last year among the steps we took to slow down or stop such an attack in the future. Um, and they have a link in their, in their in, in this post. Here's a link to their since withdrawal submission to the Black Hawk, Hack Conference along with um, Ed Felton's analysis at the time. We've been told that the payment to CMU was at least one million. There's no indication yet that they had a warrant or any institutional oversight by Carnegie Mellon's institutional review board. We think it's unlikely that they could have gotten a valid warrant for CMU's attack as conducted, since it's not narrowly tailored to target criminals or criminal activity, but instead to appear to have been indiscriminately targeting many users at once. Such action is a violation of our trust and basic guidelines for ethical research. We strongly support independent research on our software and network, but this tack crosses the crucial line between research and endangered innocent lives, our innocent users. The attack also sets a troubling precedent. Civil liberties are under attack. If law enforcement believes it can circumvent the rules of evidence by outsourcing police work to universities, if academic Demia uses research, in quotes, as a stalking horse for privacy invasion, the entire enterprise of security research will fall into disrepute. 
Legitimate privacy researchers study many online systems, including social networks. If this kind of FBI attack by university proxy is accepted, no one will be will have a meaningful Fourth Amendment protection online and everyone's at risk. When we, when we learned of this vulnerability last year, we patched it and published the information that we had on our blog. We teach law enforcement agents that they can use Tor to do their investigations ethically, and we support such a use of Tor. But they were the but there were but the mere veneer of law enforcement investigation cannot justify wholesale invasions of people's privacy, and certainly cannot give it to the color of legitimate research. Whatever academic security research should be in the 21st century, it certainly does not include experiments that pay that indiscriminately in dangerous dangers without their knowledge or consent. So that's uh, Tor's position. And then we're going to talk about a couple of the other DN anonymized uh, hidden service attacks that popped up. In, and some of them are kind of like a little bit of bugs, if you will. So a new attack on Tor can de anonymize hidden services with surprising accuracy. De-anonymization de requires luck, but so, nonetheless shows limits of Tor's privacy. Uh, computer scientists have devised an attack on Tor's privacy network that, in certain cases, allows them to de-anonymize hidden services websites with 88% accuracy. Such hidden services allow people to host websites, so we'll explain what that is. Okay, our goal is to show that it's possible for a local passive adversary to de-anonymize users with hidden service activities without the need to perform end-to-end -end traffic analysis. The researchers from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Qatar Computer Research Institute wrote in a research paper. We assume that the attacker is able to monitor traffic between the users and the Tor network. The attacker's goal is to identify the user in either operating or connecting to hidden service. In addition, the attacker then aims to identify the hidden service associated with the user. The attackers work by gathering the network data of predetermined lists of hidden service in advance. By analyzing patterns of the number of packets passing between the hidden service and the entry guard it uses to access Tor, the researchers were able to obtain a unique fingerprint for each service. They were able to later use the fingerprint to identify the service, even though they were able to were unable to decrypt the traffic it was sending. In a press release, the researchers elaborated. The researchers' attacks require that the adversary's computer serve as a guard on a Tor circuit. Since guards are selected at random, if the adversary connects enough computers to the Tor network, the odds are high that at least one on some at least on some occasion one or another of them will be well positioned to snoop. During the establishment of a circuit, computers on the Tor network have to pass a lot of data back and forth. The researchers show that simply by looking for patterns in the number of packets passing in each direction through the guard guard. Machine learning algorithms with 99% accuracy determine whether the circuit was an ordinary web browsing circuit. During the establishment of a circuit, computers on the Tor network have to pass a lot of data back and forth. The researchers show that simply by looking for patterns in the number of packets passing in each direction through a guard, machine learning algorithm could, with 99% accuracy, determine whether the circuit was an ordinary web browsing circuit, an introductory point circuit, or a rendezvous point circuit. Breaking Tor's encryption wasn't necessary. Furthermore, by using a Tor-enabled computer to connect to a range of different hidden services, they show that a similar analysis or traffic pattern can identify those services with 88% accuracy. That means that an adversary who lucked into the position of guard for a computer hosting a hidden service could within 88% certainly identify it as a service host. Similarly, a spy can walk into the position of a guard for a user could, with an 88% accuracy, tell which site the user was accessing. The research is sure the research is sure to interest governments around the world, including the U.S. On at least two occasions over the past few years, FBI agents have been, have exploited software vulnerabilities. Once Adobe Flash and once in Mozilla Firefox to identify criminal suspects. Recently unsealed court documents show how the FBI sees a tour hidden to child porn site and allow it to run for weeks so agents can gather evidence on visitors. In an email, Tor project leader Roger uh, Dingledine said the requirements of the attack greatly limited the effectiveness in a real world setting. First, he said the adversary must control one of the entry guards a hidden service is using. Such entry guards, in theory, are signed randomly, so attackers would have to operate a large number of Tor nodes to have a reasonable expectation of seeing traffic at a given hidden service. 
Additionally, he cited research from last year arguing that researchers routinely exaggerate the risk of website fingerprinting on anonymity. He went on to question the clarifier algorithm that allowed the researchers to identify certain traffic as belonging to a Tor hidden service. It would be hard to thwart it, he said, but adding random pattern to the data being sent. I'm not surprised that their classifier basically stops working in the face of more padding, he wrote. Classifiers are notoriously brittle when you change the situation on them. So the next research step is to find out if it's easy or hard to design a classifier that isn't fooled by padding. So fingerprint detection basically on the Tor network is a potential possible exploit. Um, this article mentioned the Firefox Zero Day. Uh, this is an article from uh, Deep Dot Web by Benjamin Vertus. Firefox Zero Day can be used to de-anonymize Tor users. This is from December 2016. Recently, a Firefox D Zero Day was used to target Tor users. Experts say the code is nearly identical to what the Federal Bureau of Investigation used in their hack against Tor users in 2013. However, on the same day the exploit came out, the Tor Project and Mozilla published browser updates that fixed the issue within the software. The Tor Project was notified about the zero day by a user who posted the exploit code to the Tor mailing list from its Sing Singit darknet email address. This is a JavaScript exploit actively used against Tor browser now, the anonymous user wrote. Shortly after the user posted the exploit code, uh, Roger Dingledine, co-founder of the Tor project team, confirmed that the fact that the, and said that the Firefox team had been notified. He also added that Firefox found that the bug, that the bug and are working on the patch. On November 28th, Mozilla had an update in the browser for a different critical vulnerability. Uh, several researchers started an analysis on the zero-day exploit. Among the experts was Dan Guido, CEO of Pillar of Bits, who made a post on Twitter that the zero-day exploit is a garden variety used after free, not a heap overflow, and is not an advanced exploit. The researcher added that the vulnerability is present on the Mac OS, but the exploit does not include support for targeting any operating system but Windows. Security researcher Joshua Yabit told the media that exploit code is 100% effective for remote co code execution on Windows systems. The shell code is used, used almost exactly the shell code of 2013. And uh, the security researcher used the pseudonym of the WAC alone and tweeted, When I first noticed the old, old shell code was so similar, I had to double check the dates to make sure I wasn't looking at three year old posts. The researcher referred to a payload used by the FBI to denonize the user to the dark web child porn site. This allowed the bureau to tag Tor users who visit the illegal website on Freedom Hosting. The exploit code reforced the browsers to send sensitive data such as MAC addresses, hostname, and IP addresses to third-party server with a public IP address. The FBI only had to request customer information from the IPS to acquire the identity of the hacked user. And it goes on, the Tor malware calling home to French IP addresses is puzzling, though I'm not, I'll be surprised to see a U.S. federal judge authorize that. The same, day, the same day as the zero-day exploit was discovered, both Tor and Mozilla published a press release that they had fixed the issue. So you also have to factor that it's just, you know, human error on zero days, some of the browsers and stuff like that affect Tor as well. Here's another effort from another set of security researchers at Princeton University Royal and the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. While the use of Tor constitutes a significant privacy gain over the off-the-shelf web browsers, it's no panana, and the Tor project is on front about its limitations. This call researchers devised two correlation attacks dubbed defective Tor to de-anonymize Tor users using also data from observations of the DNS traffic from the Tor exit relays. Uh, this comes from Security Affairs. Uh, the technique was dubbed a uh, defective Tor by researchers. They leverage on the observation of the DNS traffic from Tor exit relays. For this reason, the method could integrate existing attack strategies. We show how an attack can use DNS requests to mount highly precise web website fingerprinting attacks. Mapping DNS ta traffic to websites is highly accurate even with simple techniques, and correlating the observer's website with a website finger fingerprinting attack 
greatly improves the precision when monitoring, monitoring relatively unpopular websites. So another fingerprinting attack. Whew. Our results show that DNS requests from Tor exit, re, exit relays traverse numerous anonymous systems that subsequent web traffic does not traverse. We also find that, the, that a set of exit relays at times com compromise 40% of Tor's exit bandwidth uses Google's public DNS service, an alarming high number for a single organization. We believe that the Tor relay operator should take steps to ensure that the network contains more diversity in how it exit relays resolve DNS domains. So there needs to be more exit relays and just the configuration needs to change um, those who operate exit relays um, to help improve Tor. Uh, the experts highlight that Google, Google operates public DNS servers that observe almost 40% of all DNS requests exiting Tor network, a privileged point of observation for attackers. Google is also able to monitor some network traffic that is entering the Tor network, the experts report. An example that traffic via Global Fiber or Viva Guard relays that occasionally run in Google's cloud. Additionally, Google can monitor some network traffic that is entering the Tor network, for example, via Google Fiber. Okay, three three. The experts also remarked that DNS requests could be used to obtain other precious information about the traffic for Tor users that traverse anonymous systems and, and internet exchanges. There are entities. Entities on the internet such as ISPs, autonomous systems, or internet exchange points that can monitor some DNS traffic but not web traffic coming out of Tor network and potentially use the DNS traffic to de-anonymize Tor users this winter. Past traffic correlation studies have focus on linking the TCP stream entering the Tor network to be the one exiting the network. We know that an adversary can also link the associated DNS traffic which can ex be exposed to many autonomous systems at the TCP stream. On the other side, experts from the Tor project are already working on a series of significant improvements to the popular anonymous network. In March, the Tor project revealed how the organization has conducted a three-year-long work to improve the ability to detect fraudulent software. While Tor developers are already working on implementing techniques to make website fingerprinting attacks harder to execute, there are the actions that can be taken to prevent uh, defect Tor's attacks, such as Tor re relay operators ensuring the network retains more diversity in how exit relays resolve DNS domains. And then, um, <clears throat> former Tor developer created malware for the FBI to hack Tor users. So you got an inside man that helped. The Daily Dot by Patrick Hal O'Neill. Um, published April 27th of last year and then was updated as recently as February of this year. How does the U.S. government beat Tor, the entity software used by millions around the world, by hiring someone with experience on the inside? A former Tor project developer created malware for the Federal Bureau of Investigation that allowed agents and mass users of the anonymity software. Matt Edom, a cybersecurity expert who worked as a part-time employee of the Tor project, a nonprofit that builds Tor software and maintains the network, almost a decade ago. Since then, he developed a potent malware used by law enforcement to unmask Tor users. It's been wide welded into multiple investigations by federal law enforcement and U.S. intelligence agents in several high-profile cases. It came to our attention that Matt Eden, who worked with the Tor project until 2009, so eventually was employed by a defense contractor working for the FBI to develop anti-Tor malware. The Tor project confirmed in a statement after being contacted by the Daily Dot. So that's another way to, you know, attack a system. And then you have Tor being possibly infiltrated by uh, CI contractors to work actually on the Tor project in itself to exploit, and there's a piece then. Um, post that I've linked in the show notes. Um, you, you can read at will. And then ultrasound tracking can be used to denonize Troy, um, Troy, Tor users. Um, this was posted January 5th, 2017 on Slashdot. Um, ultrasounds emitted by ads or JavaScript code hidden on the page access, access through the Tor browser can denonize the 
anonymize the Tor user by making nearby phones or computers send identity beacons back to advertisers. Data which contain, contains sensitive information that the state sponsor actor can e actors can easily obtain via subpoena. The attack model was, was brought to light towards the end of 2016 by a team of six researchers who presented their findings at the Black Hat Europe 2016 Security Conference in November and the 33rd Chaos Communication Congress held, up, held last week. Their research focused on the science of ultrasound cross-device tracking, or UXDT, um, a new technology that started being deployed in modern-day advertising platforms around 2014. The UXDT relies on advertising hiding ultrasounds in their ads, where the ads play on a TV or radio or some ad code runs a on a mobile or computer, it emits an ultrasound that gets picked up by the microphone of a nearby laptop, desktop, tablets, or smartphones. These second stage devices who silently listen to the background will, will interpret these ultrasounds, which contain hidden instructions telling them to ping back to the advertiser server with details about the device. Advertisers use UXDT in order to link different devices to the same person and create a better advertising profile so to deliver better targeted ads in the future. The attack that the researcher team put together relies on tricking a Tor user to, into accessing a web page that contains an ad that emits ultrasound or accessing a page that contains hidden JavaScript code that forces the Tor browser to emit the ultrasound via the HTML a audio API. And then we're going to cover a few more uh, problems that are not necessarily just um, government exploits or just bugs or zero days, but just in general, um, companies, they don't want to mess with Tor. So the other problems that Tor has um, faced, and some of it's, it's just been ongoing, but because of, again, the spotlight the Salt Road marketplace has placed on Tor, um, and with this collapse, and the fact that Tor and Bitcoin has been used as an excuse, or this, I should say, the Silk Road Marketplace and Bitcoin has been used as an excuse to kind of go after the Tor network itself with all these different types of investigations. Um, certain things have accelerated, and some things have always been there, but there's, you know, businesses and places that will not allow you to connect and will block you if you attempt to connect with a. Um, Tor browser, for example, Netflix, uh, Hulu, uh, Spotify, Vivo, those streaming services that people love, you couldn't connect with Tor. Um, even something as simple as the white pages, you know, 411, if you want to look up information, you would be blocked if you were using a Tor browser. Uh, let's see, financial institutions, hotels, uh, sports, not so much, but like FIFA. That seems very weird. Um, social net networking services. Uh, Pinterest, Twitter. Um, eh, if you use an iPhone, I think you can get on the browser. Yelp. Um, let's see what else. Airbnb is a partial block. Gmail. Um, Walla. Inbox.com. Skype attempts the untoward exit or rejected. Um, KYIRC, which seems very weird. Web chat. Oh, so what else is weird? Um, Crunchbase, Google Analytics, Rite Aid, Nike.com, SD.com, Abooks, Chase.com. Bitcoin dot, Bitcoin talk dot org registers may be required to, to pay five dollars to order to connect to Tor. So it's silly stuff like that. And the reason I bring it up is Cloudflare. So Cloudflare released a statement and is notorious for blocking um, Tor connections to the sites that it protects. So the trouble with Tor by Matthew Prince. Um, was released March 2016, uh, March 30, 2016. 
The Tor project makes a browser allows anyone to surf the internet anonymously. Tor stands for the Unknown Router, and it describes how the service works. Traffic is routed through a number of relays across the internet. Okay, kind of just want to let you already know. Think of it as like a black box. Traffic goes into the box, it bounces around between a random set of relays, and ultimately comes out to connect to the requested site. Anonymity is sure because anyone monitoring the network would have a difficult time trying to tying the individuals making the request going into the black box with the request coming out. The importance of challenges to anonymity. Anonymity online is important for a number of reasons. We at Cloudflare believe in it. Believe in it. For instance, Tor is instrumental in ensuring that individuals living in oppressive regimes can access information that they otherwise be blocked or illegal. We believe it is so important that we offer our services for free through Project Galileo to protect politically and artistically important organizations and journalists against attacks that would otherwise censor their work. On the other hand, anonymity also is something that provides value to online attackers. Based on the data across the Cloudflare network, 94% of requests that receive across the Tor network are per se malicious. That doesn't mean they are visiting controversial content, but instead they are automated requests designed to harm our customers. A large percentage of the comment, spam, vulnerability scan, ad click fraud, content scraping, and login scans comes via the Tor network. To give you some sense based on the data from Project Honeypot, 18% of global email spam are approximately 6.5 trillion unwanted messages per year you begin with an automated bot harvesting email addresses via the Tor network. At Cloudflare, we're not exclusively treating traffic from Tor any differently. However, users of the Tor browser have been more closely, more likely to have their browsing experience interrupted by catches and other restrictions. This is because, like all IP addresses that connect to our network, we check the requests that they make and assign a threat score to the IP. Unfortunately, since it's just a high percentage of requests that are coming from the Tor network are malicious, the IP for the Tor exit nodes often have a very high threat score. With most browsers, we can use the reputation of the browser from our from other requests is made across our network to override the bad reputation of the IP address connecting to our network. For instance, if you visit a coffee shop that is only used by hackers, the IP of the coffee shop's Wi-Fi may have a bad reputation. But if you've seen your browser behave elsewhere on the internet acting like a regular web surfer and not a hacker, then you, we can use your browser's good reputation to override the bad reputation of the hacker coffee shop IP. And then it kind of goes on and on. Um, security and the convenience, pick any two. We offer three kinds of services, good, cheap, fast, but you can only pick two. Good and cheap won't be fast, fast and good won't be cheap, and cheap and fast won't be good. This issue reminds me of those sides you see in diners, fast, good, cheap, pick any two. In case the three competing interests are security, anonymity, and convenience. Unfortunately, you can't provide all three, so the question is, what do you sacrifice? Our customers signed up for Cloudflare to protect them from online attacks, so we can't sacrifice security. We also believe anonymity is crucial, having witnessed firsthand how repressive regimes use control of the network to restrict access to content. That leaves sacrificing a big bit of convenience for users and control freaks. So they explain that they use cap capta Jews, which are so damn annoying. They talk about imperfect solutions, long-term solutions. Here we go. The long-term solution is something would be something that allows automated malicious traffic to be distinguished from non-automatic traffic coming through the Tor network. We see two two viable ways of doing that, but we need help from the Tor project to implement either of them. The first would be to make it easier, maybe automatic, for Cloudflare customers to create an onion version of their site. These onion sites are only accessible via the Tor network and therefore less likely to be targeted by automatic attack. This was Facebook's solution when faced with the same problem with Google's Origin. The problem is generating SL certificates to encrypt traffic to the onion site. Tor users ask generate with a weak SH1 algorithm to generate onion addresses and then only use 80 bits of the 160 bits for the hash to generate the address, making them even weaker. This creates a significant security risk if you automatically generate SL certificates. An attacker can generate the site it collides with an 80-bit onion address and get a certificate that can be used to encrypt encrypted traffic. Because of this risk, a CAB slash B form, which regulates the issuance of CLS traffic certificates, requires certificates for onion addresses to be EV certified. EV certificates require extended validation procedures to limit the risk that can be issued to malicious parties. Unfortunately, those same procedures prevent EV certificates from being issued automatically and make them prohibitively expensive for us to automatically create for all customers. 
The solution is for the Tor project to support a strong hashing algorithm such as SHA-256 for onion dressers. With that in place, we believe the CA slash B forum could be open to discussing the automatic instance of certificates that will allow us to create an onion sites for our customers, whitelist Tor traffic to the onion site, and continue to protect our customers from automatic attacks via, sent via the Tor network targeting the non-onion sites. And then you talk about client site ca capitures. So what's next? Um, Cloudflare is working to reduce the impacts of capitures on Tor users but without any way to compromise the anonymity and without exposing our customers to additional risks. Over the coming weeks and months, we'll roll out changes designed to make the lives of legitimate Tor browsers users easier while keeping our customers safe. Our, mi our mission is to help build a better internet that means protecting websites from harm and ensuring the web users who wish to remain anonymous are able to do so. We believe the internet will be better off if we do so as a site that will not find themselves wanting to ban Tor users completely just because of the geek. As we have done with DDoS attacks, we are working to put in place technology that will filter out the bad coming from Tor while allowing the good through. And we are, we are happy to work with the Tor project to make that a reality. And then something that popped up um, in 2016 was FBI's Tor hack shows the risk of subpoenas to security researchers. Researchers who expose hack, hackable vulnerabilities, this is from Wired, and our friend Andy Greenberg wrote this. Uh, hackable vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities in digital products, products face tons of plenty of occupational, occupational hazards. They can have their work censored by threats of lawsuits from the companies whose products they hack, or they can even be criminally indicted if their white hat, hat hacking runs afoul of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But one still mysterious encounter between a security researcher and a law points to a newer, equally troubling possibility. They can have their work subpoenaed in a criminal investigation and used as a law enforcement tool. A judicial ruling released yesterday in the case of Brian Farewell, an alleged staffer of the defunct dark web drug site, drug site Silk Road 2 to confirm what many who followed the black market's downfall had suspected in months, that the FBI, FBI was able to bypass the anonymity of software tour, the central key tool used by the Silk Road 2 and its buyers and sellers to evade the cops, with information they obtained from a subpoena to tour-focused security research at Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. In a ruling, the judge, Richard Jones, in the Western District of Seattle wrote, the feral IP address was obtained through a subpoena to the Carnegie Mellon while the university researchers were running an experiment in the Tor network designed to show how anonymous users and servers can be identified. This chain of events should serve as a warning to the computer security research community. It provides the FBI agent somehow learn of the research intended to be openly shared with the community that would fix security flaws they exposed, but instead the subpoena is being used in secret to identify and arrest criminal suspects when they can, they can do it again. Or they can pay you. So what is Tor doing to fix all this? To, to kind of address the concerns that it has with all these, these security issues, these vulnerabilities. Some of them are zero days. Some of these are specifically targeted because researchers have um, maybe had good intentions or are willing to help Tor, but that's not what happened. So these are the things that the Tor project is doing. One, Tor will feature more Rust code to prevent harm to computer. The Tor browser is heavily modified version of the Firefox browser with many privacy enhanced features. It will include more code that Rust code will run later. The Tor project developers first proposed featuring more Rust code in 2014, but the proposal never got any traction. Rust, which is a program language developed by Mozilla, is safer is a safer version of CC of C which makes it more difficult for developers to accidentally introduce memory corruption errors in their code. Firefox already includes Rust code. Mozilla started shipping its first Rust based debunks in Firefox in December 2016. And the programming language is expected to take a down the road of Firefox uh, development, eventually replacing most of its ancient C and C++ code. Since Firefox versions feature more and more Rust code starting coming from Mozilla's HQ, it was only a matter of time since the Tor project had to address the issue. In the meeting held last week in Amsterdam, four developers got together and decided what ha would happen to the Tor browser in the future. Another successful way that Tor is trying to 
the new building site and the all new nice lighting. Various government agencies and someone is exploiting the wire by Amy Green Greenberg is about to get even easier to hide on the dark web. It came out this year, so sites on the so-called dark web or dark net typically operate on what, what seems like a privacy paradox. While anyone who knows a dark website's address can visit it, no one can figure out who hosts the site or where it is. It hides in plain sight. But changes coming to the anonymity tools underlying the dark net promise to make a new kind of online privacy possible. Soon, anyone will be able to create their own corner of the internet that's not just anonymous or untraceable, but entirely undiscoverable without an invite. Over the coming months, the nonprofit Tor Project will upgrade its security and privacy with so-called so onion services or hidden services that enable darkness anonymity. While the majority of the people who run the Tor Project software use it to browse the web anonymously and circumvent censorships in countries like Iran and China, the group also maintains codes that allows anyone to host an anonymous website or server as a basis for the dark net. The code is now getting a revamp set to go live sometime later this year. Um, we'll talk about some of the upgrades, but there's continu continuous upgrades. Designed to both strengthen its encryption and let the administrators easily create full secret dark net sites that can only be discovered by those who know a long string of unguessable characters. And those software tweaks, says Tor Project co-founder Nick um, Matheson, could not only allow tighter privacy on the dark net, but also help serve as the basis of the next generation of encryp encryption applications. So basically, uh, hidden services are going to become invite only. You wouldn't be able to search for them. It'll make it very difficult for um, anyone to track or seek out these sites. You have to have a, a, an invite. So the Basically, the vulnerability will just come back towards um, humans. If, for the example, in the Silk Road case with the Kurdish Green, if they're able to flip somebody that has access or knows the address, then they'll get the in. But for for a majority of hidden services, if they're not like a drug marketplace, they will be, um, or a CP site or something nefarious like that, um, they wouldn't have necessarily have that bit of concern so much. Uh, but anyways, uh, someone can create a hidden service just for you that only you know about, and the presence of the particular hidden server would not would be non-discoverable, says Matheson, who helped to code some of the first versions of Tor in 2003. As a building block that would provide a much stronger basis for relatively secure private systems uh, than we've had before. Beyond anonymity, most darknet sites today make no secret of their existence, widely publicizing their onion web addresses on the regular web and social media for potential visitors. Any whistleblower can visit WikiLeaks anonymous upload system, for instance, by pasting, um, and it has the unaddressed address, into the Tor browser, and many thousands of drug customers and dealers know that the notorious dark web uh, drug market uh, Silk Road uh, 3 could be found at uh, before the FBI took it offline, or actually the original Silk Road here. But even without knowing the Tor hidden service address, another trick has allowed snoops, security firms, hackers, and law enforcement to discover them. Tor network comprises volunteer computers that serve as nodes bouncing traffic around the globe. Anyone can position the computer at a particular sort of node, one of thousands of hidden service directories, then route visitors to a certain hidden service. For that routing system to work, all hidden services have to declare the existence of the directory. A study released at the Hacker Conference DEF CON last year showed that more than 100 of the 3,000 or so hidden service directories were secretly crawling every site whose address they learned in order to scan the dark web for previously under undiscovered sites. The only people who should know about your hidden service are the people you tell about it, says John Brooks, the creator of the Tor-based chat program, um, uh, Ricochet. That's a pretty simple co concept, and that's current and that's true. The next generation of hidden services will use a clever method to protect the security of those addresses. Instead of declaring their onion addresses to hidden service directories, they'll instead derive a unique cryptographic key from that address and give the key to the Tor hidden service directory. Any Tor user looking for a, hidden, a certain hidden service can perform that same deep revision to check the key and route themselves to the correct dark net site, but the hidden service directory can't derive the onion address from the key, preventing snoops from discovering any secret dark net address. The Tor network isn't going to give you any way to learn about onion address you don't already know. The result, Matthew says, will be the dark net sites will, with new, stealthier applications. A small group of collaborators could, for instance, host files on a computer no one, known only to them. No one else will ever find that machine, much less access it. You can also host a hidden service on your own computer, creating a way to untraceably connect to it from anywhere in the world, while keeping its existence secret from snoops. Uh, Matthews himself hosts a password-protected family wiki and calendar on a Tor hidden service, and now says he'll be able to do away with the site's password protection without fear of anyone learning his family's weekend plans. 
Tor does already offer a method to make streaming service inaccessible to all but certain Tor browsers, but it involves the finicky changes to the browser configuration. The new system, Matthew says, makes the level of secrecy far, far more accessible to the average user. The next generation of hidden services will switch from uh, using 1024-bit RS encryption key to a shorter but tougher to crack EV25519 elliptic curves uh, keys. And the hidden service directory change means that the hidden service URLs will change from two from 16 characters to 50. But Matthews argues that the change doesn't affect the dark web addresses usability since they're already too long to memorize. Matthew has a bigger ambition for secrecy changes. He hopes that he can foster more tools that allow untraceable private communications like uh, Ricochet and the Tor-based file sharing application OnionShare. Those apps automatically create Tor hidden services on their users' machines for private communication. So preventing anyone from discovering their private Tor instance will make sim similar apps easier to build and more secure. It's these cities that are using hidden services as a building block that are going to get far stronger with, with much more privacy than they had before. And then here comes the law enforcement aspect. Uh, the feds won't know what they don't know. The security of Tor hidden services have come under scrutiny since a massive law enforcement purge uh, took dozens of dark websites uh, offline, including uh, a reincarnation so early in late, in late 2014. Uh, we already know this information. The Tor project fixed the flaw that allows the attacks to endanger discovery, says Matthews, but even if sim similar vulnerabilities were found in the future, the new hidden service directory system would in theory mean that the most secret hidden services would remain safe. Law enforcement would be able to use the, atta the attack on any site whose addresses have been known. The ones with widely publicized addresses might still be vulnerable. The potential to foil law enforcement raises an inevitable question. Will undiscoverable hidden services become a magnet for the worst part of the dark net, including markets for stolen tools, stolen data, hacking tools, or child pornography? Matthew offers the answer that Tor and much of the rest of the encryption world is looking for years. The strong privacy tools offer a social societal trade-off and one that's worth making. If the only way to ensure the social, uh, okay, I'm going to spell it out because I don't know how to pronounce it. D-E-L-E-T-E-R-I-O-U-S, the use of the internet, where insecure, being insecure is to make everyone insecure, I don't think that leaves the world better off, he says. On the whole, humanity deserves privacy and does better with it than without it, even if some of the things we could do with privacy are things we prefer to control. And then I'm going to read a, a synopsis. A major key alert, anomalous keys in Tor relays. Um, it was published by Princeton University uh, by George Panopsis of the Tor Project, Claudia B. Roberts of Princeton University, Laura M. Roberts of Princeton University, and Philip Winter, Winter of Princeton University. Uh, it was published uh, April 3rd of uh, 2017, and the abstract is, uh, is this. It's more than 10 years of existence. The Tor network has seen hundreds of thousands of relays come and go. Each relay maintaining several RSA keys, accounting to millions of keys, all archived by the Tor, Tor project. In this paper, we analyzed 3.7 million RSA public keys of Tor relays. We, one, check if any relay share prime factors or MUBE, two, identify the relays that use non-standard exponents, and three, characterize malicious relays that we discovered in the first two steps. Our experiment revealed that 10 relays shared MUBE and 3,577 relays, almost all part of the research project, shared prime factors, allowing adversaries to reconstruct private keys. We further discovered that 122 relays that used non-standard RSA exponents presumably an attack, an attempt to attack Onion servers. By simulating how Onion services are positioned in the Tor's distributed hash table, we identified four Onion relays that are likely targeted by malicious relays. And this paper just kind of breaks it down. I have a list of papers that are talk about attacks, but also about protecting um, Tor and their efforts to upgrade. And the last synopsis of the paper that I'm reading is called So Fernando, Securing the Tor Browser Against the um, um, Anonymization Exploits. Written by Mauro Cody, Stephen Crane, Tomas Ferrasco, Andre Hamoskis, George Copen, Pierre Larson, uh, Christopher Leitrin, Mike Carey, and Ahmad Ruiz uh, Sagin. And this was published last year. This is the abstract. Tor is a well-known anonymous communication system used by millions of users, including journalists and civil rights activists over the world. The Tor browser gives non-technical users an easy way to access the Tor network. However, many government organizations are actively trying to co compromise Tor, not only in regions with oppressive regimes, 
but also in the free world as the recent FBI incident clearly demonstrates. Exploit software vulnerabilities in general and browser vulnerabilities in particular constitute a clear and present threat to the Tor software. The Tor browser shares a large, large part of its attack surface with the Firefox browser. Therefore, Firefox vulnerabilities, even patch ones, are highly valuable, valuable to attackers trying to monitor users of the Tor browser. In this paper, we present Cell Fernando, an enhanced and practically low time randomization technique for the Tor browser. It defends against exploits such as the one the FBI allegedly used against Tor users. Our solution significantly improves security over standard address spaces by Firefox and other mainstream um, browsers. Um, moreover, we collaborate closely with the Tor project to ensure that Sanando a fully compatible with address sanitizers and, comp and comply our feature to detect memory corruption. ASAN is used in hardening versions of the Tor browser for test purposes. The Tor project decided to include our solution in the hardening release of the Tor browser, which is currently undergoing field testing. So, this is what Tor is doing. They're seeking to, um, again, combat all the various exploits. They're literally building the project from the ground up. Currently, they are in, um, let's see, which version they are in? Uh, Tor.0. Uh, Tor 0 0.305 is released and is almost stable. So this will was released of uh, 2017.0405, so March, April 5th, and um, they're fixing major bugs and, and patches, and they're adding the hardening of the browser. The, there's been these releases that have been happening um, throughout uh, not only this year but of last year, fixing these um, vulnerabilities. Making sure and making sure that Tor is usable for all people at any point in time, and you know this is essential if you believe in privacy, you believe in peer-to-peer um, -peer communication. That Tor is possible. Uh, decentralized marketplaces um, are incorporating Tor um, as a result of the not only the upgrade to Tor in itself, but because of the the overall structure, the privacy nature of Tor, and the fact that the Tor project is actively seeking not only to um, fix these vulnerabilities and counter it, but to make sure that their funding is not solely from the government. They're seeking um, various funding from other sources so that they're not uh, vulnerable to um, any government withdrawals or any grant withdrawals that they may experience. But in general, they're actively, you know, they've been very open, actively seeking to protect and counter um, all these different um, attack vectors that have been happening to, um, to the Tor browser. And all of this is, you know, response. Some of these vulnerabilities have been there for a while. Some of these vulnerabilities are things that, you know, take time to fix, uh, particularly relay relays and diversification of that and making sure that another vulnerability is the fact that so many relays go through... Um, a good chunk of the same ISPs, making sure there's a diversification of nodes, um, working with people that gain that understanding and diversifying not only the nodes but the community, but making um, basically not only say rebranding but um, relaunching themselves in a sense that they, they are the privacy browser, the privacy network, uh, the privacy means of engaging on the internet. Another thing that has uh, developed is the fact that um, other um, software protocols and network protocols that, uh, that have been around for a while are getting a second look through and increase um, development because of the, um, the Tor hacks and the Tor uh, vulnerabilities and, um, that have happened as a result of the Silk Road Marketplace and the, the attack vectors against these dark market websites. So you've had uh, ITP, which Open Bazaar and other decentralized marketplaces are incorporating as a means of connecting to um, the internet to these decentralized marketplaces. Um, ITP is the, Invi the Invisible Internet Project. Uh, the ITP network provides strong privacy protections for communication over the internet. Many activities that risk your privacy on the public internet can be conducted anonymously through inside ITP. So this is another program you can download onto your computer and allows you 
to uh, connect with the internet in um, a similar manner, like Tor, but differently. Um, in general, there's a series of connections like Freenet, which has been around for a very, very long time. I think it's probably one of the most popular darknet uh, friend to friend by default connections. Um, it was created in what year was it created? Um, in 2000, so 17 years ago, around the same time as uh, Tor was coming, or a little bit before Tor became a development, March 2000. Um, people are uh, relooking at Freenet and trying to make it more usable, user friendly for people to use. Uh, GnuNet um, is the same thing. There's an F2F network type typology option is enabled. There's another option to connect to the internet. It was developed uh, all the way back in November 5th of 2001, so it's 16 years old. So people are looking at that as a framework of peer-to-peer -peer connections, uh, networks for people to connect to the internet. And all of this, um, mind you, is a result of the fact that um, Tor was attacked. And Tor was attacked because of the success of the Silk Road marketplace. All those vulnerabilities, all those dark net um, marketplaces that were taken down in the wake of the collapse are, is a direct result of the spotlight that was um, shined on this platform. And Tor in itself came out in 2002. So it's been around for a very, very long time. And um, it's nice that it's finally getting um, not only the extra funds and monies, but the extra development and intention and um, attention, I should say, and the uh, develop it to harden the privacy so that people can surf the internet and not worried about being tracked or traced or specifically being targeted by the government because of the actions and behaviors that they may or may not do on tour. So that's it for this episode. Um, our next episode will be um, Mount Gox. Um, that'll be the last episode of the covering the Silk Road um, marketplace and the aftermath of that. Um, and then we'll just have a kind of a wrap-up episode, a very small wrap-up episode. And that will basically be the conclusion of the, the, of the series of podcasts dealing with the collapse of the Silk Road, Road Marketplace and all the different both good and positive things that have come out of its collapse. So thank you for listening and tuning in. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.